In the afternoon section, we, we are going to have a broad range of topics. The first topic is trade agreements and international trade. And of course, for that purpose, we have a professor with um, outstanding record of publications. Uh, you can actually argue that, or, or that's my belief or my opinion, that he's the major figure in global economics, especially when you project to Latin America and Europe. Uh, early on in his career, he developed techniques, computational techniques, to evaluate trade agreements, and he's been using uh, those general equilibrium techniques initially in Europe, when Spain joined the EC, he was doing consulting for the Spanish government, and then he was very influential to uh, the first uh, NAFTA agreement uh, to help Mexico uh, in that agreement. So let me welcome Ping Pijo, thank you very much. Thank, <coughs> thank you very much, uh, Manuel. You're about 12 years old at the time. That's why it was so long ago. And thank you, too, uh, Paolo, for inviting me. Okay, I'm going to talk about uh, some broad topics, but I'm going to focus on uh, the, uh, the, the dangers that uncertainty in, uh, in uh, international trade are giving the uh, global economy. And um, I'm very lucky that... Uh, that uh, Alex uh, Warner talked about uh, this to some extent. Uh, this morning you'll see some of uh, Alex's themes being repeated in my talk. And also, um, I'm gonna touch a little bit on how the world economy has grown and how that's due to globalization. And here I'm gonna t uh, touch on some of the things that uh, uh, Federico was saying. I was very intrigued by Augustine's discussion of payment systems and uh, cryptocurrencies, but I have nothing to say about that. <laughs> okay, so um, we're gonna keep my talk on time so we can ask uh, some people to come up and uh, ask me questions and get into a general discussion on this uh, towards the end. So in case I don't really have time to do it, let me just give you the bottom line uh, of the talk here. Uh, the, the first point is echoing uh, a number of things that uh, uh, my friend uh, Federico uh, Sturzenegger was talking about. The Industrial Revolution uh, started in 1880. His contention that the world actually grew between uh, uh, 1 BC, and, uh, 1 AD and uh, 1800, that's controversial. I mean, that's Angus Madison's point. And, uh, I, I have a friend who's an uh, economic history professor uh, at uh, Davis, Greg Clark, and he contends, no, there was no growth. But the point is, it was zero or tiny. And then the world started growing in uh, 1800. What's fascinating when we talk about the Industrial Revolution, as economists, we think of it as something that happened in the first half of the uh, 19th century, where for most of the world, it's happened in the last 50 years. And, uh, and uh, uh, Federico showed us that big, uh, beautiful video by uh, Hans uh, Rosling uh, that pushes that. Now, after the Second World War with, uh, with uh, Bretton Woods, uh, there was a desire on the part of the uh, uh, victorious uh, allies who were beginning to call themselves the United Nations at that point of uh, implementing systems to avoid the problems uh, that led to the Second World War. And there were three Bretton Woods institutions. And of course, you know about the World uh, Bank and the IMF, and you probably don't know about the International uh, Trade Organization, which was stillborn. It, uh, the first steps in it became the GATT, and now it's the WTO. And that was very successful in promoting multilateral uh, trade liberalization around the world, uh, and we, uh, we had an explosion of, of world trade. That, unfortunately, 
over the last uh, 20, 30 years has slowed down with big disagreements, especially on uh, agriculture. Uh, and so the engine of uh, economic growth has become something that the Gatineau, the WTO uh, permits are regional preferential uh, trade agreements. Uh, the European Union, of course, is much more than that, or tries to be much more than that, but it started that way, and, uh, and things like NAFTA. Uh, that's in danger from uh, popular, uh, populists on both the left and the right. Uh, now, and part of the reason is obvious, is we have in rich countries uh, workers moving out of uh, manufacturing. Manufacturing as a percentage of GDP uh, in the United States is, and as a percentage of un, uh, employment uh, is in the low teens. Do you know what the, do you know what the record year for real manufacturing output has been? Sometime back in the 50s, right? No, it was last year. We'll beat it this year. Uh, we're producing more and more. It's just it's cheaper and cheaper, because and we're more and more efficient. Now, what's interesting is lots of countries, including the United States, have justifiable com complaints about uh, Ch China's uh, trade practices, and and some things they do kind of informally, like insisting that anybody who wants to uh, do business in China. Uh, give the Chinese partners that they're more or less forced to have uh, access to their uh, intellectual property. Um, there's ways to handle that, and I think we're doing a, currently, the United States, we're doing a very bad job. Uh, this should be handled through the WTO and in uh, concert with our allies, uh, Europeans, Mexicans, and, and Canadians. Huh? Uh, and yet we're engaging in this trade war that is fraught with uh, dangers. One of the dangers could be if we press too hard on the Chinese government, this didn't quite come out of Alex's talk in, in the morning. We saw China's still about the fastest growing major country in the world, but that growth rate has slowed down a, a lot. It might not really be there, all of it, and uh, pushing more in that direction could lead to uh, uh, instability problems in, in China. War, no one ever wins wars. Uh, trade wars or, or uh, wars of violence. Finally, uh, I was, my best friend from graduate school, Jaime Serapuche, was the Secretario de, de Comercio e Industria. Uh, Fomento Industrial in, in, in Mexico, and I was his uh, advisor when we negotiated the, uh, uh, the NAFTA with the United States and Canada. And of course, we, we were very nervous about what would happen. I, I got Jaime to help me organize a conference in Minnesota, and we brought together the top uh, negotiators uh, of the United States and, and, and Canada with the Mexicans and we discussed what could happen with NAFTA. The, the quick answer, of course, is basically nothing. Uh, the USMCA is just NAFTA too. Um, with small changes that aren't good uh, in automo automotive trade, and dairy, actually all my Canadian economists think they're trying to open up the uh, Canadian dairy industry is a very good idea. Um, it's kind of like U.S. economists think about sugar. I know here sugar is an important topic. You might not realize uh, some of the biggest sugar producing states, of course they're here uh, in the south, but they're also up along the Red River Valley between uh, Minnesota and, uh, and North Dakota. And they depend on this sugar subsidy, the U.S. sugar program. Uh, that's kind of embarrassing. Um, okay, here's, here's a picture, and I'll spend a few minutes to talk about this and maybe get through other things quickly. So th this is going to not be as dramatic as Fr Frederico's uh, picture, but I want to make a couple points about this. First of all, the United States 
uh, got involved in the Industrial Revolution uh, around the same time as England, but was behind England uh, most of the time. We grew very slowly uh, up until right after the, uh, uh, the Civil War, and then we started growing at 2% per year. That's that uh, red dotted line. And that's what we've grown at since then. With the exception, uh, the big exception, of the uh, Great Depression uh, and the subsequent uh, World War II buildup, uh, and of course, the Great uh, uh, Depression was very much uh, aggravated by worldwide trade wars. There's also something to worry about that economists were all worried about it. Uh, following the uh, recession that started seriously in the United States in uh, uh, 2008, um, we've never recovered. You, uh, unemployment's at a low level, but wages, number of people working, are nothing like they were in 2000. We haven't recovered. Uh, trade's doing better, but it hasn't recovered. We haven't had, uh, over the last uh, eight, 10 years, the kind of recoveries we've had after uh, other recessions. Everybody likes to say, oh, that 2008 recession was the worst since the Great Depression. Some people call it the Great Recession, yeah, I don't, yeah, 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 whatever. Uh, it was interesting that it was global, so I'll call it the global recession. 1981 to 83, that so-called double dip recession was just as bad. That's not the typical picture. Here's a much more typical picture. This, I put uh, Japan here. Numbers are a little bit different. Could be Germany, could be France. Um, these countries were cruising along uh, at growth rates similar to the United States before uh, the, the, uh, the Great Depression. And the Great Depression was followed by wars where their economies, instead of growing, were contracting because all the bombs and so forth we were producing on, in the United States was, were being dropped on many of them. Uh, afterwards, they not only went back to the old path, but changes, institutions, so forth, they had miracle growth until they got close to the United States and then leveled off. So I'm just going to mention this quickly. Um, I'm going to refer to some papers. Well, I'll find a way through Manuel, if anyone's interested, uh, to give you some links. So you can go to my website, too, and find some of them. Here's a project I'm working on with a couple former students. And we went back and looked at um, Walt Rostow's book, The Stages of Economic Growth. And Walt Rostow was a great economist, but writing in 1960, before the Industrial Revolution had spread all over the world, he thought that was the difficult stage. Now that, the, now that uh, we have, have had open trade, investment, and so forth uh, following the, the Second World War, and advanced countries are so advanced, if you're in a poor country, you just have to do almost anything right, not everything right, to have a period of growth like the, uh, like the Great uh, like the, um, Industrial Revolution in Britain. And so the first stage of growth, and that's what we should focus on, and what I'm going to do here, um, was, to, uh, was to do as well as Great Britain had done in the first half of uh, the 19th century. There's something else to remember here, but I'm not going to stress. So many countries have gone to the second stage of economic growth, but then do not proceed to becoming truly rich countries. They become rich compared to what, what they were before. They become world middle class. And in China, in Korea, and so forth, there's a really heightened awareness of this. And they call it the middle income trap. That's not what I'm discussing today, though. In Latin America, that's where most of the countries are. We have a few in Central America, or the Caribbean, Haiti, for example, uh, that are still stuck in the Malthusian uh, trap. 
uh, where they're just a bad harvest away from starvation. But most, even Chile, um, Chile had uh, some of the fast, fastest growth rates in the world, uh, 1983 to uh, 98. Since then, it's grown like Mexico. Um, former student of mine, Rafael Burgoynes, the head of the National uh, Productivity Commission, and we're going to start working on a project on that. OK, but here's a picture. It's just not as beautiful as the one that uh, Federico showed us. Here's what I want you to see. 1960, more than half of the population of the world lived in countries that had never had what Rostow called sustainable growth. Now 2% do. And those countries, and I mentioned Haiti, for example, but countries like Yemen, Afghanistan, uh, they're, not the, they're not the truly big countries. China and India, uh, and those were the driving forces in the picture you showed us, uh, were able to get in on this. Nowadays, globalization, globalist, has become a really bad word. It's fantastic. Globalization is what's responsible for incredible in, in, uh, increases in uh, living levels around the world. OK. Trade. Um, Alex, of course, has had uh, uh, access to better, more up-to-date data. I just used the standard sources, and so I'm still a year uh, a year and a half behind on some of, some of my data. But um, as I mentioned, that has not recovered. It was on an upward trend, uh, both in the United States and uh, throughout the world, but just has not come back. And is part of the story why the world is in, and I don't want to say it's a slow growth period, it's just growth at a lower level than what we should have been on. The whole world's about 10% poorer because of that uh, uh, global re recession. But all of our growth in trade has come about because of uh, Canada, Mexico, and China. That's where all the action is for the United States. Given the size of Europe, our trade with Europe is tiny. Europe has six times the GDP of Canada and Mexico together, and yet we trade much more with Canada and Mexico. And they're the people we're picking fights with now. Now, here's another fact to keep in mind. Um, President Trudeau, when he talked to uh, Prime Minister Trudeau of Canada, said, oh, well, I bet you that we have a trade deficit with you. Sure enough, I went and checked, and we do. But, OK, that is a statement fraught with so many problems, it's incredible. Uh, but let me, let, me, let, let, let me tell you what the biggest problem is. Depending on the year, over the last uh, 25 years, between about uh, one-fifth and one-third of U.S. exports every year are services, not goods. And we don't have great data on that. I mean, well, the United States does, but it's not comparable with any other country's data on it. That hasn't been harmonized in the same way the League of Late Nations, then the U.N., and now a special WTO make uh, participating countries report data in similar formats. We don't have anything like that. And it's inherently difficult, I'll get to that in a second, in measuring uh, trade and services. But the United States is by far the biggest service exporter in the world. Of course, you know when you call uh, your credit card company or bank, you might get a, uh, uh, an operator in India and India does export a lot of services, but it's nothing like the United States. What are big services we export? Uh, business services, because we're the headquarters of so many of the world's multinationals. 
management services, design services, financial services, and all those services connected with uh, royalty or patent payments, pharmaceuticals, uh, so forth. Productivity in goods, and this is what we already mentioned, this is why the U.S. is producing more goods than ever, but it's not showing up as fractions of current value GDP because the prices are going down so, so fast. And this is, this is something, again, uh, uh, Federico showed us. Well, these are goods, not electric power, but yeah, yeah, and light bulbs. Well, I guess the light bulbs themselves are part of uh, your story. Electricity is too, and that's not. Okay, so. The Manuel was mentioning that, uh, and I can't, I'm a, I'm a nerd. I'm an economics nerd, and I work on models, and I have lots of grad students who work on these projects with me, and we build computer models that are general equilibrium models. To, especially now, we focus more than we did back in when I was working in Spain or Mexico on dynamic models. And we wanted to see the impact of uh, our big trade deficits uh, over the last uh, 25, 30 years. There's a paper that just got published last year in the Journal of uh, Political Economy with, uh, uh, with my former students, uh, Kim Rohl, uh, who's at Wisconsin, and Joe Steinberg in Toronto. Yeah, we had, we called them global imbalances. Even though nowadays the biggest global imbalance is the rest of the world with uh, Germany, not with China. But, um, but in, in this period we're studying, it's our big trade deficit principle, the, the U.S. trade deficit with China. And that's that solid uh, black line. And then we fed this into a model with demographic changes, uh, all kinds of other de uh, de uh, demographic uh, features, but the biggest changes in tariffs, the biggest thing we fed in with those productivity series that I showed you before. And we had to do something to get the Chinese government to follow the same kind of buy U.S. bonds, not U.S. goods, and keeping the, uh, uh, the, 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 um, the yuan uh, exchange rate down. And that's that red line. But you know, if we had had no export intensive Chinese policy, we would have had the green line. What is this? This is the share of US labor in goods production. It's technology. It's technology. Can we get the jobs that have gone from the United States to Mexico or China back? No, they're not coming back. If the jobs would be done in the United States, they'd be done by robots. Okay, I've already mentioned this thing about trade and services. I, I want to get on to the more exciting uh, thing later, um, but a couple of friends of mine working with people at the BEA, Bureau of Economic Analysis, like the U.S. Uh, National Statistics uh, Bureau, uh, were looking at how difficult it is to make, uh, look at trade and services, especially bilaterally. You know, I have a bunch of former students of mine, if they decide not to go into academics, work at places like PricewaterhouseCoopers or Deloitte or something like that, uh, 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 majors consulting or uh, accounting places, coming up with schemes to do what's called transfer pricing in an efficient way. And that's especially important with trade in services. Let me just give you an example. Ford in Detroit exports uh, to Ford in Amosillo, okay? 
What does it export? Design services, all kinds of services. Who gets paid for those? Um, Ford in the Bahamas. Well, you didn't know Ford had a big factory in the Bahamas. I bet you didn't. If you say you did, you're lying, because they don't. They have a little office with three people that has hundreds of billions of dollars in revenue. See what I'm saying? Why is that? Because they don't pay tax. It's like putting your money in your uh, SEP IRA or something like that. Park it somewhere where you pay no taxes and accumulating. Bring it back only when you need to spend it. Okay. No. Um, yeah, I've mentioned this thing about the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, I had a list. We're looking at anti-dumping and trade war, um, uh, trade war experiences, the few that we have. It's, oh, as a citizen of the world, I'm really terrified about the possibility of trade war killing economic growth for a generation or two. But I'm a research economist. Every, every dark cloud has a silver lining. Think of the d data that that's going to generate for me and my students to study. <laughs> it's really incredible. And no, we're looking at some of it. And I, had a, I was going to show you a, a list of events. But let me stop. Uh, early on in the trade war, US, you, you remember, we slapped big tariffs on uh, solar panel manufacturers and uh, uh, refrigerator manufacturers in China. The multinationals operating in China doing the refrigerating, refrigerator manufacturing just uh, shifted operations to a subsidiary they had in Vietnam and kept up the shipments without blinking an eye. Uh, China, later in retaliation, put a 180% tariff on imports of sorghum from the United States. I don't know if you guys remember this. Uh, this was in spring of last year. Chinese uh, uh, food processors who were using sorghum were terrified because of the amount of sorghum that were already on ships sailing from the United States to China, and that they'd have to pay this 180% tariff. And they pushed the US government uh, U.S. government, the Chinese government, to, uh, to back off on that. Um, so there's interesting inter uh, 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 reactions on both sides in this, uh, I guess there's good people on both sides, something like that, you know? I guess it's not that funny. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, the... The trade war, it's, it's, it, it, it's like real war. It's hard to see where it's going to go, and, uh, and no one's going to win. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. In order to bring this professor to discuss real issues in Latin America, we are inviting uh, two business leaders in, from Mexico. Those are also belong to the board of the economics department and they are benefactors of the school. So Antonio Torres, that he's been following the trade agreement very closely every day, would send me an email about the <laughs> developments and also Victor Montes de la Oca. So thank you very much. You can sit down and ask him two questions and then we'll open up to the audience. This is fantastic, but it's not fair. Uh, Manuel didn't advise me, but it's not fair in two ways because I already know these guys who we've already started discussing it, so. <laughs> good, good afternoon, thank you, good afternoon. It's been uh, an honor to be here with you. And uh, thank you, Dr. Santos, for the opportunity uh, for comment this uh, topic, the relevant topic. I will prefer to speak in Spanish. Again? Yeah. Thank you. I prefer to speak in Spanish for make it more, more complete my, my question, please. 
Okay. Yeah. Tim knows his Spanish. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> Yesterday I know this. Knows many, many languages. So. <laughs> yeah. Eh, obviamente, bueno, nosotros, eh, tomando el, eh, en consideración el caso de, de toda esta coyuntura que ha existido en el Tratado de, de Libre Comercio entre Estados Unidos, Canadá y México, y comentando un punto, yo me quiero enfocar un poco más al, eh, considerando los, para mí a lo mejor, digo, hay, hay muchos más cambios que se están dando relevantes en la propuesta, que, que bueno, obviamente todavía se tiene un tiempo para para aceptarla por parte de los congresos, eh, lo de la parte de, la, de, de los lácteos eh, Canadá, lo de la parte de la revisión periódica, el caso de automóviles, se mantienen los aranceles de aluminio y demás. ¿Tú cómo consideras que en materia de servicios financieros, servicios de educación, consultoría y demás, se tendría que reforzar o mejorar para y qué cambios eh, pudieran tener importantes, porque realmente creo que muchos nos podemos ir nada más a, al tema de, de estos cambios tan relevantes de que bueno, que sí, sí hay eh, ventajas en donde pues ya se garantizan 2.6 eh, millones más de, de exportaciones de autos en lugar de dos, hay una sesión de Canadá del 3.5 en lácteos y demás, pero bueno, en materia de servicios financieros, ¿tú qué considerarías que puede, eh, que, que va a pasar y que se puede y que se podrá mejorar en este proceso de que va a estar en congresos el, este, el, el USC, eh, USMCA. But I should answer in English? Or? Oh, yes, I'm sorry, Antonio should answer. No, 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 no. I, so the, 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 the question is that, uh, that uh, Big Thought has uh, quite a few details, and maybe I will touch on a couple of these things, like the milk producers in, in, in Canada, the... Your big question was financial services. So, so let, me, uh, let me get at that. What impact is the USMCA going to have on that? And the, the, the answer is basically none. That was not really touched by the, by the renegotiation. The 90% of the treaty could, uh, could have just been photocopied from the, uh, from the NAFTA. Um, but you know what was interesting when, uh, uh, when uh, uh, Jaime Serra, Carla Hills, and, and John Weeks from Canada were at this conference in, in Minnesota. They said when they were negotiating the original NAFTA back in uh, 1992, that they didn't foresee, anticipate all the changes that would be happening. In terms of uh, technology, think about when you're talking about financial services, the thing that uh, Augustin was uh, uh, discussing was there changes in uh, means of payments and, and so forth. And so it would be a very good idea to have this thing being constantly uh, updated. Okay? Uh, and, and now let's, let, let, we'll, let's get to uh, uh, the, 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 the milk and in, in Canada and automobiles and automobile parts in, uh, in, uh, in, 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 in Mexico. Uh, the uh, the Trans uh, uh, Pacific uh, Partnership already had it built into liberalization of um, of uh, 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 da of, uh, uh, of uh, dairy in Canada. That's more was more of an opening than is what the, 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 the U.S. negotiators were, um, were able to push in, uh, in, the, in, in the NAFTA, two, NAFTA two, I'll call it, because USMC, that doesn't come out good. Okay, in NAFTA II, um, why was it a little bit controversial is because that's a protected sector and a lot of uh, politicians um, depend on the support from the dairy industry in Canada. And the, we're gonna have uh, next week congressional uh, elections in Minnesota, in the 8th Congressional District of Minnesota, and the one and only uh, Congressional District of uh, North Dakota, uh, are right along this border, and they all vote to keep sugar, keep sugar prices high, subsidized, and, 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 and so forth. So there's people like that in Canada. Um, 
I don't think it's bad that we open up the uh, Canadian dairy, uh, the, the, uh, uh, dairy industry, but that was just done as a, as a personal insult to uh, Justin Trudeau. I mean, it, now, automobiles. Automobile jobs aren't going to come back to, they, the auto, U.S. automobile industry is doing great because it's part of the North American automobile industry. Um, and the, the, the current rules of origins and even the $16 wage requirement, this is something we were discussing at dinner last night, is not going to impact uh, Ford GM or even what's left of Chrysler, you know, Dodge Jeep. Uh, it's not going to really impact them. It is going to impact uh, parts producers. Um, and so the, you'll have to make some kind of adjustment, but it's not, it's not something that can't be worked around. Um, it's just it's hard to see what benefit the United States is going to get out of because the whole uh, North American automobile industry is going to suffer a loss of flexibility and certainty. This is something Alex was talking about today. Uh, the biggest thing with trade agreements is they give producers a little bit of uh, uh, expectation, a little bit of a, the, 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 a certainty about what economic conditions are going to be in the future. So then, Victor, you were asking about what was what were going to be called the sunset uh, clauses, that NAFTA was going to go out uh, of business, NAFTA II or USMCA would go out of business in five years. The, finally, they were so important, uh, this was the good thing about, I guess, the war with China, trade war with China. Uh, we lost sight of that, so we now have a 16-year sunset clause. Uh, President Trump will be gone in 16 years, so not particularly worried about that. Uh, Tim, uh, congratulations for your presentation. And um, in the same order, the free trade agreements, uh, it's a very powerful tool to activate the economies and uh, increase economies and the, of the countries and of the regions, right? So what do you think about the restricted clauses uh, like uh, we recently see in, in the, the free trade uh, agreement in, for North America um, when the, the partners have to consult to the other partners to make a business, for example, with China? China. Right, and um, and uh, do you think um, it's good for uh, uh, keep safe the integration, regional integration, or or not? And uh, finally, what do you think of, about uh, when a possible uh, integration and a free trade uh, agreement uh, between China and uh, India? The what I say yesterday night, you remember. That's right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The f the, no, the first one. The, it, 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 exactly. NAFTA was envisioned as a free trade agreement, not a customs union. Whereas the European uh, community uh, started out as, uh, as, a customs, uh, as, a, as, as a customs union. What, what, what's the difference? Uh, that U.S., um, U.S., Canadian, Mexico uh, trade relationships with other countries were independent of NAFTA. Now, there were, there were always rules of origin, which were particularly binding in uh, uh, textiles and uh, automobiles, but otherwise just involved, in the, the good has to be processed enough to change a tar tariff category. That was, the, for the typical sector, that was what uh, was what that was about. And uh, back in the 1990s, when I was working on this uh, in, the, in the Mexican government, uh, we always said that's an advantage to NAFTA. Because, yeah, you join, you join the European Union like Sweden did, and my Swedish friend said, now we have to pay so much more for food because we have this very protective agricultural policy. Um, so I thought that that was an advantage that NAFTA had. So 
You're, you're asking me, Antonio, if I'm concerned. Yes, I think that's horrible. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, in the second part of the question. Yeah. About the China between uh, India. Fantastic. I think I really would like to see uh, the WTO uh, to get reactivated again and to see trade liberalization be a worldwide thing. But uh, let's, see, let's see what they can do. The, from what we've seen, for example, in, in uh, South America with uh, Mercosur, or Mercosul in, in Brazil, um, yeah, it hasn't, it hasn't uh, promoted as much trade as the, as the people put together hoped. No, we, we had great questions. We had great questions, but I was so excited that I gave <laughs> things too long. Big thought. Thank you, thank you. Antonio, thank you. gracias. Thank you. Uh, Okay, our second topic is um, mergers and acquisitions. We are actually being fascinated, first, because uh, we are going to see an interesting uh, case of a merger, uh, and we are fascinating also f for the 3G company, the way they are managing things. And on top of that, uh, this is going to be like a potential case study. So we thought that we would bring to the school some real case in industrial organization. And uh, what I heard is that uh, our speaker is a great speaker. So let me please introduce Heitor Gonzalez. Thank you very much. Well, that's a, that's a big responsibility. C E O. Yeah. So he's going to explain first. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what is, uh, yeah, uh, my name is Eitor Gonçalves. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I've been uh, working in the 3G world for 23 years now. So I joined uh, Brahma when it was a small brewery there in Brazil in 1995. And um, I worked for 15 years there. I was happy or as fortunate to uh, participate on most and all the uh, growth, uh, the inorganic growth, the acquisitions and, uh, and mergers that the, the brewery uh, engaged on. And, um, and then in 2010, I was asked to join the Burger King project. And, uh, uh, and my briefing was, Ito, uh, what we, uh, you saw growing through the ranks uh, in, the, in, in the brewery, we, we want to do something uh, similar in this new industry. So I was asked to be part of the management team that would take over uh, Burger King. And uh, since then uh, has been uh, an interesting ride. So, and uh, my job, uh, it's probably the most difficult question that someone could ask me. And uh, um, I usually introduce myself as the CEO, Chief Everything Else Officer of the organization. <laughs> and uh, um, currently, I'm responsible for uh, HR, global HR. Uh, I'm responsible for all the management by objectives and um, a target setting for the organization. I'm responsible for supply chain that involves manufacturing, distribution, procurement, food safety, uh, engineering, and uh, all the restaurant uh, procedures. And I'm also responsible for the global shared services that has all the financial operations, accounts payable, accounts receivable, data management, uh, record to report, <laughs> and uh, the people tower that I guess has uh, payroll. Until the beginning of this year, I was also responsible for IT 
on top of these things. Uh, and I transfer now for our uh, chief um, uh, development and technology officer because we are giving a very strong uh, push on digital. That's so important and, 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 and relevant for this industry. Um, on top of that, usually when uh, we have an acquisition, uh, because of this um, very uh, broad um, spectrum of, uh, of areas that I uh, take care of and have been um, learning through these years, um, I participate on very actively on the takeover and the integration of the companies. And that's what I would like to share with you uh, now, um, including some of the, the uh, let's say, hallmarks of the 3G culture like uh, uh, zero-based budgeting uh, methodologies. So now uh, the questions that I the question that I receive the most uh, are the following. First is we know that uh, 3G has a reputation, right? And uh, this reputation um, uh, goes in a kind of widespread of um, of um, um, ideas or opinions. Um, but it's very usual that people say that we do have, and yes, we do, a uh, very strong culture. And, and how can and how we do to implement this culture or to deploy this culture so fast um, in uh, organizations that we acquire and uh, from then on uh, make sure that uh, this culture is established and, 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 and successful? That's the first question. Another question that's a little bit more, let's say, provocative is um, when people look, and I recently received this question from some professors of, um, uh, from, from Harvard, they said, look, uh, we see the, the practices that you, that you go um, or that you apply throughout the acquisitions or immediately after the acquisitions, and they are a kind of draconian. Um, and uh, in the sense that they look to the external world as uh, very uh, short-term oriented. Um, and, but interestingly, when we follow the performance of the companies that uh, you uh, acquire and you transform, um, on the long term, they seem to have a very steady, uh, sustainable growth from then on and, and quite impressive, and it's true. So how we reconcile this? Because it looks like you're short-term oriented, but then uh, you're not. Because when we see the data and how these companies grow and how they uh, occupy the space in the industry, uh, it seems that's something solid, okay? So uh, it's all about the culture. And uh, culture, I know that um, it's um, sometimes a very subjective uh, uh, thing. But I will, um, and I hope that uh, in these minutes I can uh, make it much more tangible uh, for you. So, uh, culture is everything. Culture is how we do things. And uh, right away when we make an acquisition, we have to make sure that people first understand and, uh, and then live by the, 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 the culture and by the, the, the values of the, of the company. So. Uh, we do that by talking about it, but not only. We use what I call platforms of, uh, and programs that carry uh, elements of the culture and make the culture tangible. So those programs are, uh, first of all, they must be uh, solid, and they are solid practices. So we don't invent anything, we usually use practices or uh, things, methodologies that are already there. Uh, so we didn't invent zero-based budgeting. We didn't invent management by objectives. Uh, we just apply them on a disciplined way and in a structured way. Uh, second, the, these programs, they, have to, they must have a solid basis on values and culture. Um, so when I talk about zero-based budgeting, it is not and it's not supposed to be a cost-cutting initiative. Because everybody that applies zero-based budgeting to have 
uh, or take control of the costs and uh, uh, reduce costs and get the kick at the EBITDA, yeah, will be successful, but won't be sustainable. It has to be based on something much more solid. And finally, these programs, they must be intertwined. They must be uh, mutually supportive. And uh, what makes the culture the culture? Uh, the image that I like to make is, is the fabric. Each one of those programs that I'm going to uh, go through them um, um, uh, briefly uh, in a moment, uh, they are on themselves solid practice, like, like strong threads. But what make it powerful is that we weave those threads creating a fabric that's actually what makes the culture robust, sustainable, and long-lasting, okay? So how we do that, how we weave those, uh, those programs. So, and what I'm gonna describe to you now is what I call the performance cycle. It's a, a, a process and a way that we, we, we take over companies, but not only. We also uh, run or this, this cycle when, and turn it every time, uh, even in uh, the acquired companies. Why? Because by maintaining those programs and maintaining those programs connected, is the way that we sustain and we keep the, the culture uh, moving and, and, and uh, growing. So, first thing that we do when, uh, uh, when we take over a company, we set stretch targets. It's the very first thing that we do. But now, different than many people might think, it's not jo those financial targets. They come too, but it's not, we don't start from setting uh, uh, crazy EBITDA targets or uh, uh, revenue targets or cost cutting targets. It's not, it doesn't start from that. It starts with the dream. It starts with the vision. And, uh, and how is that? On the day one of uh, the day after the closing of the deal, we have at that point already appointed uh, the, the management teams. Uh, this management team defines the vision for the brand or for the company right away. BK took one week uh, discussing. We were new to the business. Uh, Tim Hortons take, took one day. Popeyes took four hours to define the vision for the, for the, for the brand. And the, right, and the whole management team does this together with the CEO, with the appointed uh, leader, okay? That vision is structured, is designed in a way that has inspirational words, as most visions have, but also a bridge to uh, concrete, tangible, observable results. So in the vision of BK, uh, Burger King, uh, when we say that we want to a strong franchisee system as part of the vision, we mean it we mean that we want partners that can invest, that have investment power and will to do that. And we measure it. When you talk about uh, having uh, the best burgers in the world, that's part of the vision of, uh, we're talking about a uh, consumer preference and we measure that with tools with in, in marketing. When we want to be the best uh, player in the industry, we mean EBITDA margin. Uh, and profitability and growth and net restaurant growth um, uh, through. Uh, so we, 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 conf we design uh, a vision that we can translate uh, later on in observable, uh, tangible uh, indicators. Then we convert that vision into a five-year plan on a strategic plan. And if it's an acquisition, we do that uh, we use usually the platform or the model that was used to understand and, and evaluate the, 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 the opportunity. If it's an ongoing business, it's usually the strat plan that, uh, that we do it at each, at every three years. We redo the strat plan and we rethink about the strat plan. Uh, and then uh, uh, we relaunch the challenges. So we get that information 
and we cut that information into uh, pieces. It's a strat plan, multi-year plan. So if we want that to happen, the first year has to happen. Actually, many companies fail already there. They have a strategic plan, and, and they don't get the first year of the strategic plan, and they don't deploy that into uh, the targets of the management team. Oh my god, that means that we have to grow 10%, 12% on the year one? Oh my god, that's too tough. The industry is not growing that. So let's, then they fail right away. Uh, the strat plan asks for a growth of 10% a year, for example, and, and then and they, and they put on the, on the objectives of the management uh, 5%, 3%, something safe. We don't do that. We put what it is. Um, but not only that, we get uh, the management by objectives methodology that cascades uh, the, man the, the targets of this management team that has been uh, defined through that uh, deployment. And then what we do is we make sure that these targets or these objectives are cascaded downwards by geography or by specialty. Uh, if there's a, a, an initiative that depends on IT, depends on uh, back office shared service, it depends on the frontline operations, all these people will have those targets. So we assure in a vertical alignment and horizontal alignment on that. And then I would say that most companies drop there. They don't do this. You know why? Because it's a pain in the neck. Uh, the CEO of the company and myself, we read something like 400 pages of uh, uh, 10, 8 to 10 KPIs for each individual in the top in the, uh, people in the organization. We read and we assure that these things are aligned, that the numbers are tracked, the numbers are uh, well uh, um, uh, managed, that they, they do what if the restaurant growth is that number, the closures and the openings of the restaurants have to sum. But funny enough, uh, many times people miss that, okay? So it's complex, it's a process that takes three months, and we do that every single year with the discipline. But we don't stop there. We then monitor during the year. Most companies, when they set targets, they set targets that are vaguely defined, people don't know from where they come from, uh, they are badly, described and then they put on the drawer and gonna see it nine months from then to what if they achieved or not but that doesn't count actually because the performance appraisal doesn't take in account only that there's a lot of subjectiveness uh, assessment we track our, our KPIs in those pages every quarter every quarter all the managers of the organization sit down with their reports and go through line by line of that thing seeing asking and discussing if the thing is going on is going well or not of course in meanwhile they are tracking the projects uh, as well okay so that's the first block but then people come to me and ask okay so i understand you arrive you set stretch targets why people care about that why people would care about, about having stretch targets you're just moving their cheese right you're just a uh, 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 um, uh, creating trouble for them, right? So we enter with, uh, with a, a second brick on this process that is aggressive compensation. Now, aggressive compensation, as many people, when we think about aggressive compensation, it's interesting because everyone thinks about big bonus and uh, 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 impressive uh, stock option plans. Yes, we do that, but that's not aggressive. Aggressive? is that we couple with that, what many companies don't do and don't want to do, we couple that with modest base compensation, modest salaries. We pay below the market your fixed salary, okay? So meaning that if you don't achieve your targets, then you will earn less than your colleague that does exactly the same job in another company of the same size. You will earn less if you don't achieve your targets. If you achieve, then you earn much more. Uh, and how we know that this model works, uh, since the takeover of Burger King, we made more than 300 millionaires already. And if you make the math, I have only 10 
people on the, on the executive team. So I have people that are really low in the organization that have more than a million dollars in the bank today. Okay, so. Uh, now, there's another aspect of the aggressiveness of our compensation. That is the, how we structure our long-term orientation and uh, our long-term incentives. Most companies have long-term incentives and uh, the investors that are here would appreciate that. Um, three year and vesting uh, uh, a third, a third, a third every year. So there's partial vesting or four years, 25% every year. We don't like that. Why we don't like that? Because we don't believe that is one retentive, but that's not the worst thing. We don't think that this actually aligns decision making of the management team and their reports towards the long term. So our compensation, although people complain when we are, it's difficult to hire people uh, with this kind of offer, but it's five year cliff. So five years, you don't see one cent of what uh, your grant was, uh, was uh, uh, of the grant only five years from now, okay? So that is, uh, when, uh, when, I, when I hire people and try to explain people, I say, I, I like to ask, say, okay, uh, you want to be an owner, I want to be an entrepreneur, yes, and I understand that your company. So what's the salary of the owner of the bakery? It's zero, it's zero. If you don't sell the bread, you don't have the uh, salary. And the owner of the bakery, when he has a nice month, what he does, he takes what is necessary and the rest he reinvests in the business. That's what we try to bring to life. Now, then people stop and say, okay, you have stretch targets, aggressive compensation. How do you assure that people don't get to achieve those targets at any cost? Because then you throw money and you get your targets, right? So we enter with a third brick, that is scarcity of resources. And scarcity of resources, I mean it's scarcity of everything. Budget, people, space, privacy, time, we constrain everything, okay? Now, uh, many people misinterpret uh, the ways that we do these things. So uh, zero-based budgeting, for example, uh, uh, reduces a lot the, the, the amount of money. And, uh, but it's interesting that uh, we realize that there is a logic that people have in their private lives and they change it completely when they enter in a company. So all of us have uh, bank accounts, right? So if you want to buy a, 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 a shoe and a suit, and you, don't, you look at your bank account and you don't have money enough to do that this month, what do you do? You wait, you make choices, right? You buy the shoe first and then you wait two, three months to buy the suit, right? So you make choices. Interestingly, people when they join companies, they forget that. They think that they should have, they deserve to have all the money that they need to do all the things that they want. They don't want to make choices. They think that there is this widow throwing money into the business out there. That this, this does not exist, okay? So, uh, and no. <laughs> so uh, that's a logic that people, most executives don't, and uh, uh, people that join the company say, no, I don't, I, I need all the money. No, you have to make choices and you'd better make the right choices because you have your targets to deliver, okay? The second thing that's a kind of a misinterpreted um, uh, by the, um, uh, on, our, on the ways that uh, we do things is our uh, uh, reduction of people, okay? I usually arrive in the companies and uh, we reduce quite a bit of the number of people. But what we find in, in most companies is a very strong unbalance of two of our values actually, uh, that is empowerment and accountability. And how this plays. Uh, 
in most companies, in a lot of companies, uh, for you to have a, a project approved, you need the stamp of six people in the hi hierarchy. Everyone has to stamp the project to make sure that this project happens, right? All of them are powerful because if one of them does not uh, stamp the project, it stops there, okay? But now let's imagine a situation where this project is approved and then is a disaster. Now you want to go back to that organization and hold them accountable. So what do you do? You go to the first guy that created the project and gave the first stamp and say, hey, how can that you create this project? And the guy looks at you and said, yeah, my fault, but you know what? Five guys with higher pay grade than mine stamped it too. I said, oh, yeah, uh, I should not uh, go on the small fish. Let me go to the big fish. And the big fish goes there, top executive of the organization and say, look, I'm a top executive of the organization. You pay me too much. I'm too expensive for checking all the details of the project. I have a team for that. Now I know that they're incompetent, but yet yeah, so you should not blame me for that. I said, okay, so I cannot hold this guy accountable either. So I go in the middle of the organization and then the guy looks down, looks up and me. Okay, so what we do is simple. We cut them all. We keep two and give the stamp and the accountability to them. So now you guys are owning the project and I know exactly who you are. Now, because there is more visibility, they are more responsible. They, they choose the projects because uh, that organization of six people has capacity. So they have, there is a proliferation of projects that don't actually bring any value to the organization, but keep them busy and powerful, right? Now, they don't have capacity. Now they have to make choices. They're gonna let go the 10 projects that they actually believe that is gonna bring value to the organization, and they actually believe that are good projects because they will be accountable for it. Then people stop me there and say, okay, Ito, Stretch targets, high compensation. If you don't get your targets, you don't get big money. And then scarcity of resources. Who in hell wants to work in this company? Yeah, it's tough. So I have to come with my fourth brick on the performance cycle. That is our talent management methodology or approach. Our talent manage management approach has uh, some components that are very known by people and some that are not so clear. The first, the, w the one that's very known is that we promote from within. But that you hear from many companies. Many companies say we promote from within. We are proud of that. The statistics on this is 40%. The good ones, the, so meaning that 40% of the time that you have a vacancy, you look down, companies look down, and find someone in the ranks and put in that position because the person is ready for it. 60% of the time they go to the market and, uh, and hire someone to the, to, the, to the job. Because they don't have the guts to do what we do, that is the following. We promote, is the second point of our talent management, we promote people before they are ready. We don't search for ready people, we search people that have the grit, people have that are smart because we hire them like that. People that uh, want to put energy, work hard, are humble to learn, okay? And are hungry to grow and know what that means from a point of view of putting time and energy on it, okay? So what happens is uh, my number on that recruiting from within is 1.2. So most of the jobs that I have in the organization, uh, I, I, I hire from within, and the vacancy that's created downwards, I'm also hiring from within. Now, it's not bigger because I have some specialists that I eventually have to hire from the market and it's healthy that we do because we bring knowledge, we bring, uh, we oxygen the organization with new uh, information, but not that much. And I have the, my entry levels. My MBAs that I hire have a strong program and my uh, uh, recent graduates, the undergrads program. I hire uh, 30 to 35 MBAs every year. 
and I hire a hundred uh, uh, young graduates uh, every year, every single year across the world. Okay, so, and then I hire them with the profile that I need, and I develop them in the ranks so they they understand what is about. And again, uh, one thing that I didn't mention when I talking about uh, uh, scarcity, everyone in the organization is subjected to that scarcity. Okay. So I don't have an office. The CEO of the company doesn't have an office. He has a desk. If you go in uh, 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 Blue Lagoon Drive here, right in front of the airport, and you go to the seventh floor, you come out of the uh, elevator hall, you see the desk of the CEO immediately. Nobody blocking, no walls, no assistance to block your way from that. My desk is right in front of his. Okay, so. Uh, no one travels uh, or buys tra uh, tickets, uh, uh, business tickets for travels on less than six hours. Okay, so the CEO or me, many times, both of us in coach there, going to Toronto when we acquired uh, Tim Hortons. Many times, okay. Sometimes we get the upgrade. And it's great because we travel a lot, so <laughs> eventually we get it. So, uh, but if you don't role model, and if you don't show these people that we are hiring early on in their careers, if you don't role model, we won't keep the culture going. So that's what we do. Now, at this point comes the most uh, provocative question that I received. So it, uh, again, I'm not understanding this. Strategy targets? aggressive compensation, scarcity of resources, and then you put people in their jobs that don't know what they're doing. They are not ready. This is the recipe for disaster. And it is. It is. If I don't come with the fifth and last brick of this performance cycle, that is management methodology. And by management methodology, I mean, yes, things that we inherited from total quality management approach, uh, process design, process management techniques that's known in the market as lean, uh, problem solving, known in the market as uh, Six Sigma methodologies and uh, problem solving uh, classic methodologies. We have stro strong shared services uh, process, so we get everything that's transactional. We design the processes and we perform them in a solid way, constant with uh, tracking the, the, the processes. We do a, a lot of uh, monitoring of achievement of targets, so that gives the opportunity of the managers on those uh, quarter reviews to, to make sure that there's no dysfunctional behavior going on we ask how you're achieving it, how you're doing it. Our targets are, are put on the wall. If it's red, yellow, or green, everybody knows. So visual management, it's exposed. And we have a corporate university that uh, we put in place to uh, provide development training, leadership training, and, um, and um, met problem solving methodology, and some technical training too, when it's necessary. So. And management by objectives is part of total quality and, and management methodologies, and that closes the cycle, uh, being the management uh, methodology the, that we use to cascade targets uh, downwards. And then the cycle is fixed, is uh, complete. So then we do that, we implement that. So when, when people are uh, uh, confronted with that, they, they understand that the whole process and this whole design is done with a purpose to create, m first and most of all, ownership mindset. What I'm describing here for you guys is not anything different than a good owner does for their job, for their, for their business. Okay, so, and we're creating this ownership mindset and this uh, uh, ability to influence the business or heavy accountability and have power and in, 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 in within the restrictions is what creates that strong culture that cr that uh, moves the companies to have long-lasting sustainable growth 
that is, in a nutshell, what, um, what we do. And we do that when we implement the culture. It usually takes about a six months, three to six months, to do that. In Popeyes, we did in, four, in two months uh, to implement all those methodologies and keep them running. And then every year, I run the cycle again. So it's everything part of uh, a whole intertwined set of uh, procedures and, and behaviors that assure that the fabric is there. That's what I have to share with you. So I'm only going to bring Amadio Castellaneta uh, so I leave you mo uh, we have others but oh Miguel wants also we wanted the faculty to participate too so there will be two questions but if possible brief questions so we have time for so Amadio did in my class a case of mergers and acquisitions and wrote a big matrix of game theory so he deserves a prize so welcome here thank you I'm a real testimony about that because my son worked at uh, Burger King. Oh, yes. Herm Laporte. Yes. And uh, I always try to understand why, how, with this, like you would say, the, the bricks, uh, aggressive, uh, scarcity, and he loves to work there. And uh, with this in mind, is there a way that you can I don't know, I work in a big 500 uh, top company. It's completely the opposite. And I can see the, with this approach can help us that we do a lot of M&A, the culture. Uh, I don't know if you have any study or sh book to recommend to share this because it's very interesting. Look, uh, I think that the, the it, it has to be a full package. Right, it's the many many people. You can imagine that uh, I receive visits of uh, many people from all uh, different companies, and can you tell us how to implement uh, zero-based budgeting? He said, "Yeah, I can." Your CEO wants to travel, uh, uh, coach. Um, I don't know actually. Uh, you, your CEO wants to 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 stay on the Staybridge Suites. That's right close to the, the to the uh, Oakville office of Miami. That's a three-star. We all stay there. We even put the board once there. It was funny because the guys were totally the the, the crew of the the hotel was totally obli oblivious that they probably had the highest wealth ever in all hotels of the whole chain ever. So they were totally oblivious of that. So it was funny to see. Um, but, uh, but it's, it's a full package. Now, there are some, uh, some things that uh, we use as, uh, as, as references and, uh, and some things that have good insights in our uh, um, way of doing things. For example, uh, Good to Great from uh, Jim Collins has several elements that explain a lot of, uh, uh, of aspects of the culture. Uh, talking, for example, they, he has this concept of the leader type five uh, that is someone that is absolutely uh, I mean, ambitious for the business with no personal specific ambition to be the, the, the star CEO or things like this. So uh, that has a lot to do with the humility aspect of our, of our culture. Um, and uh, so there, there are some, some things th there, but um, any classic z zero based budgeting article or it, it has, has the recipe, has the recipe. But it's important that, that ha it's, it's based and structured in, 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 in a bigger context. That's, that's the most important thing when we implement anything. And again, the, the way our culture is not a unique culture that exists out there. Uh, I usually say to people, look, uh, uh, we put a man in the moon and there was nobody from 3G there. I mean, it's not the only way of doing uh, successful things, but it's important that it's connected, is part of a context. 
That's the most important thing. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It has been very interesting. Um, my question is whether you are following the same policies uh, or do you think that you can follow homogeneous policies in different countries? For example, if you try to implement an aggressive compensation policy in some countries, it may be very difficult. For example, uh, my wife is Italian, so if you try to implement an aggressive policy, it may be uh, a very difficult situation, right? So I don't know if you are following homogeneous compensation policies in different countries, or you are adjusting it uh, to the uh, to the culture of the of, uh, of the country. For example, Amazon had serious problems in Germany. So, what is the adjustment that you are uh, uh, that you are uh, following in those cases in different countries? Yeah, we we do we do try to adapt to the to the culture, but not that much. Uh, if you stop and think, entrepreneurs and owners of business exist all over. In, in all countries, there are owners of businesses. There are people that are doing business. The design of our compensation, and our, uh, it's, it's just emulating what, what would be the compensation of an owner of a certain business. And then we give authority for the person for that area. area. So it, it ties, actually. Now, I have a, an interesting story about that when we merged with Interbrew, and uh, uh, that was um, in 2004, so 14 years ago. I was a little bit more wild than I am today, so uh, I arrived there full of energy and uh, was my first uh, experience of being part of, uh, of an integration team, and my job was to change the compensation of people and introduce the target setting and management of bio objectives. So easy things, right? Things that don't touch much susceptibility. So, uh, so what happened is that I was making this presentation to a, a group of um, uh, leaders of, uh, of Interbrew at that time, Belgians. And, um, and then I was talking about uh, aggressive bonus and, uh, and uh, you make a lot of money. And uh, I was very focused on trying to explain that wealth creation opportunity for those guys, right? And, and, uh, and then there was this guy that uh, raised their hands uh, back there and say, Ito, I have two questions, actually a question and a comment. I say, okay, go on. So my first question is, it's true that all the Brazilians that, that are coming here are rich? I said, no, some of them are, I'm not yet. So um, the second, the comment that he made is the following. So look, Ito, um, I have, uh, the, the, the Belgian uh, um, education system is one of the best in the world. I don't pay anything for my children to be there. The health system in Belgium is one of the best in the world. We have the best specialists. I don't pay anything for that. Um, I have a pension that assures my, my well-being uh, uh, indefinitely after I retire. I have my own house already. I get my company car, and I travel all over the, the Europe when, uh, when, I, when I have uh, vacations, and uh, it's part of the package, and so I, I do it. So I'm happy. I don't, want, I, don't not need, I don't need to be rich. So, and then, so everybody like, all the others doing like this, nodding. And I said, oh my God, I'm with the wrong speech. In those seconds that I knew, when he started talking, I knew where he was going. I, did, I, I studied a little bit, not enough apparently, but uh, uh, about the culture and all these things. So I, I, I was thinking, how I can answer that? And I came to a realization at that moment that actually on those 10 years that I was working on, on Brahma and then Ambev, I actually never worked with a taximeter on my desk, working and seeing how much money I would make as a consequence of that work. I never did it. So I realized that I actually was putting too much, I was putting the focus of the excitement of being part of, the, of, of that project on the wrong place. So we learned a lot. So my answer to him was, no, 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 no. 
we are here bringing, bre uh, building the biggest and best brewery in the world. Maybe we are the biggest, but we are too far from being the best. And we need, we will have exciting projects. We will have things that you will have opportunity to do. Projects that you have autonomy to lead that maybe you never had before. So, uh, in, 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 in actually, the whole project, the whole responsibility, the whole challenge that we had ahead of us was always the thing that moved us. And guess what? Because we have this mindset of uh, ownership, we will uh, uh, reward you handsomely when you get the results uh, of those challenges. But we are here for the challenge. The money will be a consequence. But interesting enough, in many companies, you have the challenge, you have the thing, and the money is not there. So it's a great marriage of uh, the excitement, project, uh, uh, challenge, and uh, 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 fair compensation. So that's, that's how we designed it. But it's true, we had to learn a lot. Germany, especially, is a country very regulated on this, on this aspect. Uh, not only on compensation, but also in uh, privacy data and other things that you were in front of the Europe on those on those questions. So we had to uh, adjust and 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 and, and use uh, a little bit of flexibility to uh, to adapt and, and and get the culture uh, going. So we learned a lot. So these are your presents. <laughs> so these are your